Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the sixth Prague Populism Conference under the title Populism and the Pandemic in Central Europe. My name is Adela Jureczkova. I am the director of the Prague office of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, a German foundation and think tank and co-organizer of this exceptional conference. Populism has always been one of the faces of politics, but it is also a highly current phenomenon. Since the inception of this conference, Uh, six years ago, the general impact of populism on European and Western societies has increased even further. At the same time, we are experiencing an inflammatory use of the term in media and politics. When was the last time you read the news without coming across uh, the word populism or populist at least once? The term often serves as a political catchphrase, while the mechanisms, causes, and deeper roots of populism often remain hidden or misunderstood. Understanding populism doesn't only include the question how populist politics shape our discourse and undermines the foundations of the liberal democratic order, but also the other side of the coin, what makes people in democratic societies more and more susceptible to the music of the modern day rat catchers. And why do progressive actors fail to provide these people with a different positive vision? The current COVID pandemic offers a lot of topical material to investigate these complex questions. But there are countless further angles from which we can approach the problem. For example, national populist governments driving forward the project of an illiberal democracy in the heart of Europe, a backlash in the struggle for more gender justice or a rediscovery of the national identity that labels people of other origins or religion as a dangerous other, to just name a few. That is why I am even more pleased to welcome so many scholars from all over Europe to this conference who will sharpen our view of this complex topic with a wide variety of high quality contributions. Thus, my big thanks go to the Institute of International Studies of the Charles University for being the academic mind behind the conference and the Goethe Institute Prague for its long-standing support of this event. Last but not least, I would like to thank my colleagues from the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, especially Katarzyna Botjova, for preparing the conference with great diligence and energy. I wish us all an insightful three days full of new perspectives, original thoughts, and exciting debates. And now I would like to give the floor to Martin Maestri from the Institute of International Studies of the Charles University. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it, it, for me also, it's my pleasure to welcome you at the, at the sixth a Prague Populism Conference, which was originally scheduled last year in this ver in the very nice surroundings in Goethe Institute in Prague. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the event of the world uh, caught us and uh, we had to cancel our event last year. And but fortunately this year, even though uh, no, the situation is not so, uh, so, uh, so uh, nice that we can meet physically at the Goethe Institute, we uh, at least we managed together with the uh, Goethe Institute and Heinrich, Heinrich Bell Foundation to organize to organize uh, the online uh, Prague Six uh, Populism Conference. And uh, so it's happening, it's happening now and it's my great, great pleasure that we can be, we can be part of it. Uh, for this year, we managed to, when we thought about the topic, it was quite easy actually, because uh, what is more important nowadays than the connection between populism and the COVID situation. And in the next following two days, we will be looking at it from different angles, uh, from uh, the angle and the connection between pop uh, populism, uh, between those populists who are in the government and had to cope uh, with measures, uh, with uh, protective measures uh, uh, against the pandemic, we will be focusing also in several panels on po those populists who are actually in the opposition, especially the right-wing opposition, criticizing the protective measures and sometimes even uh, criticizing the whole uh, pandemic situation as such. And we will be also looking at, at uh, 
some kind of hidden aspect of populism connected with 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 pandemic especially in its impact and narrative towards towards various uh, parts of society and also we uh, it, it, it will be my great pleasure uh, to uh, present a book uh, which we may, uh, put together with uh, Heinrich Bell Foundation and some authors who uh, wanted to press to participate last year but and uh, as we had to cancel it instead we put it together a book which is to has totally different but no less important focus and that's uh, on populism and gender issues so that will be an, that will be like the, the final moment of of the conference focus on this very important aspect aspect uh, of current uh, current studies of uh, in populism so again uh, welcome here uh, at the six prague populism conference it's really a shame we can't welcome you uh, in the nice surroundings of, of Goethe Institute, but please uh, follow us here in, at least in this online online space. And now it's my great pleasure to pass floor to the director of, of Goethe Institute, uh, Dr. Andrei Carrido, please. Thank you very much, Martin and Adela, and uh, it's uh, my partner to thank you, the Heinrich Böll Foundation and the Charles University, being cherished partners for so many years. You mentioned it already, it's a sixth edition. And who would have thought last year when we had to cancel it or to postpone it, that even this year, 21, uh, we have to do it online. It's sad, but it's also a chance and opportunity because we can, uh, via online um, meetings or, or panels, reach out further than it's normally even if it's beautiful rooms in the Goethe Institute but it's limited a limited space and now we are uh, much more open everybody can take part if they like to and, inter and if they are interested in the topic it's a burning topic the populism it was already mentioned by Adela uh, it's a not only in Europe but all over the world nationalism populism it's growing and the pandemic um, even if it uh, was a chance perhaps to kind of go to into a different direction it it shows us merely that it strengthens uh, the answering in in easy ways and that people are following uh, these um, seducers let's uh, put it this way i'm most interested uh, what you will share with us and uh, the researchers uh, sharing with us are and i welcome them really um, very much taking part in this uh, conference dr viera uh, Zuborova uh, from the bratislava policy institute uh, it's professor andre cesar uh, from the charles university and it's professor paula deal from kiel uh, from the christian albrecht university so this already shows we are uh, europe is united in a in a topic that uh, also us the goethe institute concerns a lot because we are not only engaged in culture and language but in how we do we live together civil society and it's a burning matter because we are also talking about the topic of shrinking spaces uh, where can we meet? Where can we have this kind of uh, speaking open? Where Who is supported by government? Uh, which cultural institutions and which are limited uh, via budgets um, or personnel uh, uh, decisions? So a burning matter and I wouldn't waste time, uh, more time in the um, opening, but pass on to a very dear colleague, Katerina Velga Skolimowska, who is now in Abu Dhabi and who is moderating. No, you're not, you're? Where I'm are in you? Riyadh. I'm in, in Saudi Riyadh. Arabia. Oh, oh, in Riyadh. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so <laughs> most welcome, uh, Katerina, you are the moderator and I would pass the floor to you to really start into the matter. We don't want to lose a second. Thank you all very much. Also, Luisa Rath and Monica Lodorava, who put uh, up uh, from the side of the Goethe Institute uh, this conference. Thank you so much and uh, most interesting panel tonight. 
Thank you very much, uh, Angelika. Uh, and um, uh, I wanted to say it wouldn't be possible if it weren't, uh, uh, if it were wasn't Corona, and um, I, I would be able to moderate this discussion. It's a huge honor for me. So um, uh, I greet you, uh, all of you from Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, let's just go straight to the discussion. Um, as we heard, it's the sixth it's the sixth populism conference already. So we will not concentrate on defining what populism is. Uh, I would suggest we just jump into the topic directly. And um, this discussion is an open discussion. I'm really happy that all the people uh, from all around the world can uh, listen uh, to it online. Uh, so we will be uh, scientific, but we will be approachation, intolerance and hate speech. She obtained her PhD at Olomouc University in Czech Republic uh, and worked for 10 years uh, at Trnava University in various positions. She worked uh, as an uh, executive editor of the Slovak Journal of Political Science. Uh, in 2017, she was scholar in residence at the Oxford University and a visiting PhD scholar at, in Brussels at uh, Université Libre. Uh, from 2018, she's working as an expert and member of the working group Civil Society. And uh, since July 2017, Viera is the executive director of the Bratislava Policy in Institute. Viera, you have five minutes for your input, and then we will go further to Paula and Anshay. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Hopefully, you will see my picture that, that I share with you. Uh, it, it is no accident that I picked this, this picture is from the famous Flemish artist. It's, he's called Pieter Brugel. And, uh, I, I pick it because uh, if you don't know the saying, we are in Central Europe, if, if you don't know the saying in Poland, uh, in this madness is a method. So this is the picture of how it displays to me the current state of populism and also the current state of liberal democracy in, in uh, our region. And I'm, I'm really glad that, that uh, you gave me this wonderful opportunity to speak on such interesting topic as populism, because um, as we, I, I think hopefully we agree with all our speakers uh, in these days that there is no single way to explain the rise of populism uh, around the globe. Um, you will hear maybe that uh, economic factors um, are those who increase the support of populist party. But if we speak about our region, um, I, I will be more open to it that um, in our region, I think ideas and culture is what matter when, when we speak about populism and populistic political parties. And also it is for me hard in these days to make a prediction about the future and even harder in times that and um, the times are more fluid and fast evolving. But uh, um, what I would like to share with you, it's, it's a thought that I, I was listening a couple of uh, weeks ago to a German sociologist and he, he reminds me on how fluid uh, the, the term populism is. His name was uh, Andreas Eckwitz. Uh, hopefully I spell it correct. Um, and uh, he reminds me that uh, populism uh, was really a re reaction of, of uh, liberal democracy and its performance around the globe. And what happens actually in, in past decades, and especially in Central European region, that, that, that again, Central Europe is the region that, that will be dictating the trends not in the positive way, but on, on the negative side. And, and um, as I come coming from Slovakia and the, the pandemic hits uh, the globe, it hits also Slovak society. And uh, with what I would like to open the discussion and, and the further questions is that I, I truly believe that uh, Slovak society is an anomic society. And if you are an anonymous society, 
that uh, wh where else the populists are able to grow because um, the, 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 there are uh, powerful in those societies where you have weakened uh, democratic institution. They are powerful in those societies where social trust is zero on, or on a low level. And they are powerful in those societies who are suspicious. And all these three patterns are visible in, in the past in the Slovak society. And um, uh, for me, it's, it's quite, quite interesting that, that we are missing any, any relevant political or uh, society intellectual uh, discourse in, in, in this in Slovakia that uh, the ability to just react not only on the changes, but also on the, this kind of anomic situation is, is missing. And um, as, as you see on the picture, there are a couple of uh, remarks that, uh, that I would like to share with you, a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, data from the re uh, latest research. Uh, the first is that, um, as I already uh, said to you, according to the latest survey conducted by international or national organization, Slovak society is becoming more distrustful towards uh, a political and state uh, organization uh, and institution. But what, what is really alarming, not for, uh, only for the researchers, but also I think for the political actors, is that Slovak society is becoming more distrustful even to those members of the society with whom they share common values. And I think this is the problem. This, this distrustful uh, uh, trend to, towards not even institution, but uh, towards their citizens. The citizens are suspicious towards each other. Uh, and on contrary, um, th this has a great impact uh, on, on the satisfaction of democracy also. So uh, these are the trends for me that I would like to elaborate uh, to, during the whole discussion. And, and I would like to show you that uh, current, current trends in Central Europe uh, are visible worldwide and uh, could be seen as, as a paradigmal shift towards something newly, completely new in, in the future. Thank you very much, Fiera. As I understand it correctly, um, your claim is that there is a, a very big shift, not only uh, uh, um, on the um, level of elites and uh, and the society, but in the society itself, and that this um, uh, trend in the Slovak society is a kind of uh, um, trend uh, that is going to be visible in uh, other uh, in other countries uh, worldwide. We we have it. Uh, I, I know uh, Slovakia is is. In is an extreme when, when, when we compare it to the Western part of Europe. Still, you have mainstream politicians, you, you have rooted institutions that, that are bounded by law and that, that uh, the citizens are trust, uh, uh, the citizen trust toward those institutions are still in, in a quite a nice level. But, but uh, I would like to show you what happens in, 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 in a country where this social trust is missing, where, where this social trust is transforming to a suspicious behavior that, that is, that is uh, uh, leading to, to the, the belief, for example, that every second Slovak, and this is, this is uh, uh, the latest data from, from our region, every second Slovak believe in conspiracy theory. And th th this is something that, that needs to be discussed. You know, because if you have low social trust, if you don't have uh, a rational uh, society that believes in law, in, in science, and even in, 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 in the truth, the, the, the general truth that the, the earth is uh, not flat, <laughs> that you have a problem right now. 
Yes, thank you very much, Viera. Paula, Dil, um, I would ask you uh, now um, uh, to go into your presentation, but I will, of course, I will introduce you uh, to uh, um, to the people watching us. Uh, Paula Dil, uh, Professor Paula Dil, uh, was born in Porto Alegre in Brazil. And since April 2019, uh, is professor of political science specializing in political, political theory and the history of ideas at the Kiel University. Um, Paula Deal is an associate uh, researcher of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin and the Science Po in Paris. And um, I will not uh, uh, now uh, give a long list of your uh, guest professorships, um, mostly in the US and Europe. Um, it would take too much time. Um, and um, I think we'll just go straight to your response um, or uh, at, at first your presentation about the situation in Germany and, and then maybe um, uh, to a response to what Vieira just said. Yes, thank you very much. So I, I thank you very much, Vera, also for your presentation because you touched so many uh, points that we, we need to discuss. Um, um, well, um, uh, Cartagena, I'm sorry about that, but when you ask a political theorist not to define the objects, uh, they don't follow you. <laughs> So I'm afraid uh, I have to come back to the difference between a populism and right-wing populism, at, at, at least, because I guess we are mixing up very different things. Um, on one hand, we can say, well, they have they share something in common, which can be summarized in a narrative of the betrayed people, um, which contains all the uh, elements described by Kaz Mood in his definition, minimal definition of populism. So you have the popular sovereignty in the center of the discourse. You have the appeal for the people, I, an idealization of the people, a dichotomy between the elite and the and, and, and the people. And at the same time, you have a mistrust in mediation and in and institutions. Um, going through the communication uh, strategies in populism, you will have an extremely uh, reduction of complexity, which leads to some uh, false uh, equivalences of um, issues that are not equivalent at all. Um, having said that, um, there are many differences between uh, right-wing populism and populism as such. Um, you have to add another layer when you're talking about uh, right-wing populism, which is the right-wing extremist ideology to it. This right-wing extremist ideology can be uh, stronger or weaker depending on the situation. And the interesting point here, I think, is that um, both populism and right-wing uh, extremist ideology can vary on degree depending on the situation. This leads me to the next step of what I wanted to mention here, which is the normalization of the far right thinking. We are experiencing not only in Europe, uh, but also in the US um, and also in Latin America, especially the situation in Brazil that I happen to know a little bit better because I have relatives there and colleagues, um, where you have um, a kind of, um, you start with a right uh, with a right wing populism, with a very strong populist message, and more or less a weak right-wing extremist ideology. And with the time, um, you have a, a, a shift towards the extreme right. And I think that is the tendency, which is uh, quite um, problematic for a democracy, much more than populism as such. Um, and just to come back to what Vera already have said, I will say, well, populism had, has the advantage to touch the nodal points um, that we have uh, in, in, in democracy that never have been satisfied. So we have a lot of promises in democracy, unsatisfied promises that can become much urgent in situations of crisis. And this crisis can be very difficult, different, um, which is connected to the idea of a nomical uh, society. So in a nomical society, you can talk about a 
political crisis in the sense that you don't have a demos, you don't have a people coming together and deliberating what democracy should be. And at this point, um, you open the floor for totalitarian and for populist reactions. Um, so the populist reaction, in my view, is not a so problematic one. But when it comes together with right wing uh, extremist ideology, then you have a point which is uh, crucial uh, for a deep crisis and even even um, uh, anti-democratic uh, situation uh, that we are already experiencing all over the world in the sense of a test. So if, uh, if, if civil society does not react to it, they will win. And sometimes you have polarized societies like the US, sometimes you have a a slightly shift like in Central and East Europe uh, and sometimes you have some countries where this shift already is, is um, in a certain way uh, become more concrete and become more inst institutionalized, um, which is the case of some of the uh, countries in East Europe uh, and maybe you can talk about that uh, also for, the, for Turkey. Um, having said that, you asked me to, to comment on the situation in Germany, and I look at my watch, <laughs> have to run. Um, what I think is interesting right now um, is you have the AFD um, competing with other uh, parties and trying to capitalize on uh, many of these nodal points uh, of the unfulfilled promises of democracy. Um, we have a huge crisis of um, what we have, have been called Volks Volkspartei, which is the majority parties uh, which are um, all over the world uh, in the same way in the crisis. Um, and you have different responses to it. And the IFD is in a certain way a response to it, connecting it to um, a very strong right-wing extremist ideology, which has become more and more uh, in the foreground, uh, had come to more to the foreground in the last past years. Um, so you have a tendency uh, of radicalization of the AFD, uh, and you can say, well, they are less and less populist in the, in the central sense of the word and more and more far right, um, and so to speak. And now you have asked me to comment on the question of the, of the Quer Denker, which is the anti-COVID measures protests. Um, they are contesting the fact that there is a virus and as a, in a pandemic way, and um, they are non-believers uh, in a certain way. And and you have a lot of different conspiracy theories circulating among these pro protesters. And the interesting point here is uh, within this pro protest move movement, which is a very heterogeneous one, you have the right, the far right um, uh, organizing themselves in order to take the symbolic power of this movement and to canalize all the demands of the movements towards a right wing uh, extremist idea of society. And what we are seeing is, um, well, uh, the, um, the, the um, IFD uh, is trying to capitalize on that, but it's not really uh, in the same pay, on the same page as these movements. So they are trying, but they are not like following that, like we, we could see in the situation with Trump, uh, who was embracing the idea that the virus uh, does not exist and so on. So we have a kind of difficult situation for uh, the IFD facing this, um, this pandemic, and especially because the government, um, despite of all the critique, is getting a lot of support of, um, of the population. I think I, I spoke too much, so um, we can come back to all these points later. Thank you. And yes, definitely we will. Um, we have to. Um, thank you very much, uh, Paula, for, uh, for this uh, brief introduction. Uh, I just wanted to say that people are joining from Rome, Aachen, Croatia, and saying all of the, they are saying hello and thank you very much for addressing this topic. I think it's, uh, it's very important. And I wanted to say that all the questions that are being now uh, asked in the chat, we will, uh, we will uh, definitely address them. But now I would like to jump uh, to uh, Professor Andrzej Cisarz. Um, 
Andre is a Czech so sociologist and political scientist. He currently works um, at the Institute of Sociological Studies Faculty of Social Scientists, Sciences uh, at the Charles University in Prague. Um, he lectures, uh, as you can imagine, sociology, political soci sociology, and methodology of social sciences. Um, he's a supervisor of postgraduate studies um, and works at the Institute of Sociology of the Academy of Sciences, where he's the editor in chief of the Czech section of the sociological journal. Oh my God, so much sociology. And, um, and his research focuses primarily on political mobilization, social movements, and the sociological analysis of contemporary democracies. Andrzej, please um, tell us what's the situation in Czech Republic from your point of view in terms of populism. Okay, hello everybody and uh, thanks for having me here. And thanks for that so much sociology because you know, sometimes people dispute that I'm a sociologist since I you know, started <laughs> my career kind of started in political science. So, you know, sometimes it's very difficult for me to just like advocate that I belong to the field. So thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, here I was asked to say a couple of sentences on uh, the Czech Republic and Czech situation. Uh, I will try also to a little bit touch upon some points which has already been made. Um, Czech Republic, um, it is understood uh, and it is part of uh, East Central Europe uh, for sure. And as we have already heard, uh, East Central Europe is definitely, you know, so to say the forefront of debates on populism uh, and especially due, uh, due to Hungary and Poland, right? And, um, at the same time, some people see the Czech Republic as part of, of the whole development, basically seeing uh, these uh, Central East European countries as uh, the instances of the same type of development. And what I want to say, like on the general level, that uh, is that there are differences and that basically, you know, this uh, short comment on the Czech situation, you know, if you are to make something more general out of it, uh, would be that, you know, there are variability of ways to populism, basically. And it's not only one logic, you know, behind it. And uh, I, like in the Czech case, or you know, in the in the case of the Czech Republic, uh, basically this nature and the content of you know this populist uh, rhetoric is different uh, if we compare it to these two uh, mentioned countries. And uh, this little bit, you know, different type of uh, argumentation and different type of rhetorics than this, you know, kind of cultural nationalist type of populism, which we know from uh, other Central East European countries. Uh, you know, this is this populism, which we usually call centrist or managerial type of populism, and which is uh, something which is related to Andrei Babish and his political party, which won uh, the last elections. Uh, Andrei Babish is now prime minister. And uh, it's populism, which is based uh, on, of course, uh, critique of, uh, you know, ineffective and corrupted political elite, uh, which is basically opposed to these hardworking people. And Babish is here to basically articulate the needs and, uh, and claims and uh, demands of these you know, hardworking people. And this is, a, and this, is this, this is the second part of this discourse, like you know, the, the stress put on this effective and uh, very you know, hardworking leader, uh, namely Babish himself and his, uh, his uh, uh, party manager, basic, managers, basically. Um, the main, the main, the main slogan or the main goal, uh, the declared goal of uh, basically this uh, political organization, and I, I am not sure whether we can call it political party. It's uh, probably something like you know business party or people today, uh, you know, when categorizing this type of organizations, they uh, they use this uh, category of business party. So it is something like that, an organization completely under control of. Uh, uh, you know, the founder, um, Andrei Babish. And the main goal was basically to, uh, to transform and to uh, change politics so that uh, it is, uh, you know, like, like, like business, right? So the main slogan was uh, to manage the state as a firm. And uh, the argument that you ask us for some kind of, you know, a provocative argument uh, to, to conclude with, and I would say that uh, uh, they managed. Uh, that it's uh, it's it's it's, it's uh, interesting that they managed. Uh, uh, they basically mm -hmm. not, not in the way they promised, of course. Like you know, when they you know alluded to this you know, firm-like or managerial type of rhetoric, 
uh, they wanted to uh, they wanted to stress this you know they wanted to stress you know effectivity and things like this. But uh, what they what they actually did they they actually substitute business for for politics, right? And uh, I think that you know it's not only Babish uh, and everybody knows about his uh, conflict of interest. You know his prime minister at the same time controlling his. Uh, his uh, economic empire, but also people around him, you know, we have a newly appointed uh, minister of healthcare who is also facing, you know, uh, this type of problems. And uh, it looks like, you know, that uh, politics in the Czech Republic uh, is now a continuation of business by other means, you know, to, uh, to uh, paraphrase a well-known phrase by Clausewitz. And uh, this is something which is, which is uh, I think, different from those debates on populism. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not uh, dangerous or that, that it's somehow better than you know what uh, Viktor Orban, for example, did to uh, Hungarian uh, politics and democracy, but it's different. And um, I think it's important also uh, for us to be able to react to you know this situations in currently changing liberal democracy, uh, not only in Eastern Europe. It's important for us to see these differences and to be able to to, to be able to react and to take into account you know these differences in in, in, in different contexts. And uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's all I have for for the beginning. Uh, Andre, thank you very much. Um... I was supposed to ask you a question about differences, all of you, about the differences in Germany, in uh, in uh, Slovakia, and in the Czech Republic. But uh, frankly, when I hear you and I hear about uh, the approach of Viera, uh, who is talking more about uh, uh, um, uh, the 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 uh, huge uh, uh, distrust uh, uh, within uh, the society itself, then. Paula says, um, uh, talks about the shift uh, from the populism to right wing populism and uh, um, and uh, um, and what's uh, civil society, uh, how can civil society react to that? And you, Andre, say, you know, you, you just sketch this uh, kind of um, uh, business party model of populism, then I see much more differences than actually similarities uh, 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 within uh, the Eastern uh, uh, or Central and Eastern Europe. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that? Um, what is then so specific um, about the populism in Slovakia, in Czech Republic, in Germany, and what is actually that is um, common uh, with with, with this uh, in the in the, in the framework of this phenomenon, because I'm right now starting to really think maybe we should start with the definition. <laughs> uh, Viera, can or Paula, do you want to comment on that? You want to if you can hear me, if you can hear me, then yes, because I am changing the headset, so hopefully, hopefully you can hear me quite better than, than before. So uh, I think yeah, uh, the, there are a lot of differences, but I think what is the most common is that uh, for me, for my assumption, of, uh, this is something that I would like to rebrand all the discussion, that for me, the populism is a symptom of, of, uh, of uh, the, the liberal democracy that is not able to solve problems in the society. And populistic rhetoric, populistic political parties are, are a, a phenomenon and symptom of, of this, this, this uh, period. And for me, it's really a paradigmal shift that, that was present in the past, in the 30s, after the, the World War II. We, we have the, this kind of transformation of society, of, of structure of the society, of political institution, decision making. And right now, and, and, and let, let me jump with a, a couple of quotes about the state of liberal democracy, but because I think it's about it. It's not about populism. It's about the failure of, of current regime. And uh, yet liberal democracy became a victim of success, quote by Luke 2017, was killed when the gatekeepers fell asleep behind Levitsky was only a facade, Kraftiel. So we, we are speaking about the failure of, of 
this regime, liberal democracy, and for me, populism is really a symptom of it. It's not about the division or the alternation between left and right government. It's, for me, it's not about the division of modernization losers and modernization winners, what was uh, re re really famous in the, in the late modernity period. I, for me, really, the crucial thing is right now, or the, what, what is happening, not only in Central Europe, but what is happening around the globe, is that we are in the middle of structural changes of the society. And, and populism is a symptom of those changes because it, it is reacting, as, as uh, um, my colleague already said, it is reacting on try to formulate the answer of those problems. And the answers of the populists, especially the right-wing populists, are that we need to radically reduce the liberalism. These are the answers for them. So for me, what, what, what bound us together, Slovakia, Czech Republic, uh, even Germany, even uh, 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 Alternative für Deutschland, is this, they, 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 they call to radically reduce liberalism and to transform their nature into, into something rigid, something with national regulation, more state, more culture national culture, more national economy. So I think we are in, in the middle of, of transformation and we need to, to maybe elaborate what will be the outcome. Of Paula, I see that you want to comment on that, please. <laughs> Actually, uh, there are so many issues that, that we can discuss. So um, yeah, first of all, um, I, I think we are what we are talking about right now is not populism as such, but right wing populism, right? So it, it's it's a form of populism which is reacting to all these fissures uh, in democracy, and um, it's shifting at the same time the responses to it. Um, and and I think I see like Vera, I see as a common ground um, the, 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 the answers of the right wing populism to all over the world, to the fissures uh, that we can observe in uh, democracy right now are pretty similar. Um, so they propose to come back, and that's not populism anymore. That's a right wing uh, extremist ideology. They propose to come back to a situation when um, family issues were very connected to families and gender issues were connected to the 19th century. So the, the idea of the pater familias, and then um, also the idea that the national state is a strong one with a homogeneous culture, which is completely uh, the opposite in a globalized society. We are living in multicultural situations and we are having a couple of uh, uh, many uh, exchanges with uh, intercultural exchanges, even if you just go to the, to the, to the, to the shop next door. Um, so this situation is not addressed by these populists uh, because they are right-wing populists. So the, the, the vision for the future is actually a vision of a past in this way. And on the other hand, they have some answers which could be interesting because um, they are touching the problem of popular sovereignty in a, in a, in a sense that we are living in a more and more um, 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 how to say that, put it in, in easier terms. So our state is not controlling uh, what it's supposed to control, but the control are now decentered, sometimes in supranational, supranational uh, institutions like the EU, sometimes in courts responsible for judging a commercial situation without the states being a ruler, but one of the players. So you can see that there is a lack of popular sovereignty because as a citizen, nobody can 
make these people uh, or these enterprises and, and these companies accountable. So you have a lack of accountability here. And this lack of accountability has been addressed by populist parties, especially by right-wing populist parties. The point here is the solution for this lack of accountability is, okay, let's close everything Let's go back to the 19th century and let, let's work on a homogeneous society, um, which is not the solution. So the solution will be let's, let us democratize democracy and take back control in order to paraphrase Brexit in, another, in a completely different way. Who wants to be in charge? The people. So we need mechanisms, institutional mechanisms to make the people take back control in the sense not to form a homogeneous society, but to have the citizens in the center of democracy. And I, I think that's something that is, is very um, on the surface of a problem and is touched by right-wing populism. The problem is the democratic uh, parties and sometimes you have some success in left-wing parties or left-wing populist parties like Podemos touching these questions, but they are not addressed at all because nobody knows exactly what to do with supranational uh, institution and with this uh, system of um, networkings that you cannot have the states having any control anymore. And I, I think that's a, the background of the whole messy situation we are facing right now. Thank you, Paula. Andre, because uh, okay. I see that you're ready already. I have made some you know, notes here and uh, I will continue uh, with uh, what uh, has Paula just said, I think that uh, we can say that they, you know, what's in common, and I'm saying, you know, the same what she said, but in other words, they play kind of signaling function, right? So they basically signal that for some people, for some groups of people, there is something not working very well, you know, or was not working very well, you know, in this kind of, uh, you know, globalized uh, world, you know, in this liberal mainstream, you know, where, where, where integration is basically cherished as, as the goal and uh, something which should help everybody. And it looks like not everybody is helped by that. And uh, I think that uh, at least, you know, uh, on, I mean, we, we need to differentiate this demands, demand side from this, you know, uh, supply side, right? So, you know, on, but on the part of demand, there is definitely, you know, there are definitely people who uh, signal that uh, there is something not working well for them. And, uh, this demand has then been utilized, I think that uh, she's right, by, uh, you know, this uh, uh, radical right populist uh, uh, parties. And if I am to uh, focus just on this, uh, on this type of parties, uh, we have a comparable party also in the Czech Republic. It's not Babish, of course. Actually, my point was to say that he's different from, uh, you know, this radical right populist parties. But we have SPD, which is different from SPD in Germany. But, and it's uh, it's uh, it's a party by Tomio Kamura, who has already you know had the different uh, parties of this type, and it's, uh, it's it's a nationalist party, nativist party, which is which is which is closed closed or you know if we look at the Czech Republic, out of those which we have, it's closest to 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 have there, I would say, and it's also uh, you know the, the strength is approximately the same, so it's 10, 11 percent, which is exactly what I have there has right now, if I'm if, if I'm not wrong. So, you know, if we compare this type of parties and uh, you ask about what uh, what they have in common, basically, I would say that, that they are, you know, they are signaling even in the way we don't like, uh, because we actually all share, we all here, we all share, you know, in this globalized, you know, integrated world, you are sitting in the yard, right? So uh, these parties are signaling uh, and they are just sending a message uh, uh, to, to, to other people in the society that uh, for some, you know, groups of people, there is something not working. But then, you know, it also depends on the comparative frame, uh, so to say. And then if you ask me what, uh, or what, what is in common, uh, you know, if we compare populist parties in, in government, then uh, I'm not talking about IFD or SPD in the Czech Republic, but I would compare I know Babish, Babish part in the Czech Republic and, uh, and Fidesz uh, in Hungary. Uh, and I 
in, in, in my introduction, I said they are different. They are different in terms of content, rhetoric, you know, discursive tools. And um, also in terms of implications or policy implications so far. But, you know, if I compare these intended uh, policy implications, what's common for them is concentration of power, I would say. And, uh, you know, attacks, uh, you know, they, they are attacking, you know, all these checks and balances uh, things if they can. Uh, and, you know, Orban could attack them very much. Uh, so concentration of power, that's something uh, in common in terms of their, you know, go ultimate goals. And then also, you know, control of the media, I would say. Uh, again, Orban managed quite well. I mean, uh, quite well from his point of view in, in, in Hungary. And uh, nothing like that so far happened here in the Czech Republic, but there are clear, clear tendencies to, to uh, you know, control, for example, this uh, public uh, television, also Babish himself, he bought uh, newspapers and that is like, you know, this uh, belief that it's important to control the media is also something which is, in, which is in common for them, I think. Thank you, Andre. I think it's a claim of Paula as well, uh, the relationship between uh, populism and media. Uh, but I would um, now... Um, I'd like to ask you because you're you're describing kind of a very uh, 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 grim development, uh, but this development started before the worldwide pandemic. So this is not a new phenomenon uh, in uh, neither of these countries that we are talking about. And by the way, uh, I'm supposed to uh, greet you from Czech Republic, Mexico, and India, so um, so that you know that people all over the world are watching us, um, and um, I, I, I would like to ask you, what has changed through the pandemic? Um, because Kver Denker, um, Paula, um, I mean, it is a very recent phenomenon. AFD is not, but, uh, but uh, Kver Denker, uh, it, they are. So, so what has changed um, through the pandemic? Um, uh, is it like at the very beginning of the pandemic, everybody was saying, oh, uh, the populists, they fail, they fail their countries, they don't manage with the pandemic. So in the end, I, I really read the articles uh, March 2020, and everybody was like, ah, oh, it's going to be the end of populism. Um, and um, is it true? And uh, what are the shifts uh, uh, that, uh, that come with uh, this uh, uh, worldwide crisis? Yes, I, I thank you for the question because um, I think it's quite interesting to, to look at the situation right now. Um, it depends if you are a right-wing populist on power or in the opposition. Um, the situation of, um, and even in, on power, it's quite difficult to find one line to respond to the pandemic crisis. Uh, so some... Um, uh, some uh, right-wing populists uh, use that to close um, the space for critique. Others use, de denied the pandemic. For example, Trump and Bolsonaro denied the pandemic for a long time and they paid a price for it. So, um, but um, in the opposition, it's not only a problem for, for populist parties, but for every party, uh, when you have a kind of a exception situation um, and um, you have an imminent danger, which can be deadly. So you, all the people are waiting and expecting from the government to take control and do things in order to prevent from going to chaos. And um, that is not good for democ democracy. That's very bad for democracy because we lose our distance to power and um, the, two, uh, the, the idea that the government has to react quickly gives the government too much room to do things without consulting the parliament and uh, the, 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 the public sphere in general. Um, having said that, um, it's interesting to see that uh, for populist parties, um, the, the possibility of reaction, especially for right wing, is very reduced. 
because although everything is going uh, in a situation when you have a lot of the de debate in Germany and a lot of protests, the majority of the Germans still backing the policies of the government. So it's quite difficult to react to that. I, I expect to an increase of right-wing populist voters when we start getting the first effects of the, the, the economic crisis, which is going to be uh, prominent in the next um, years. So that's what I, I see as a, as a problem of a danger. Um, I, don't, I don't see it right now. There are two, another component which is interesting is um, that um, the IFD is getting more and more radical and less and less populist. And in doing so, they maybe uh, will lose voters because they are too radical. So the populist appeal, uh, popular sovereignty has to, to be back to, to the people. And um, we are the people fighting for it is getting, is getting more and more overshadowed by um, a far right discourse of an, a strong state under a strong party with very strong authoritarian ideas. And some people are very, um, uh, how to say that, a very insecure looking at that. So it could be depending on how the AFD is reacting to it, especially this year, because we're having a lot of elections this year, uh, that if they don't manage to come back to populism and at the same time, the, the economic crisis is not painful enough that they lose voters for the next elections. At the time, it looks like they are losing voters, but um, it depends what is happening until the end of the year. Yeah, but wouldn't you say that um, because of this development, um, you said that there is a lack of accountability, that there is um, a certain shift, people feel detached, and uh, there is a definite change uh, uh, in the democracy itself. Andre says even like, well, uh, you know, Babish, who is not right wing populist, it's still um, um, a concentration of power that we are uh, talking uh, here about and the rule of the media. Um, so even if they are not right wing, there is a, there is a huge shift in the democracy through the uh, through this exceptional rules that are uh, uh, being introduced because of the pandemic. So what what is the effect on our systems because you are a terror terrorist so I would like to know from uh, you and but from Viera and Andre as well what do you see what are the effects on the democratic system itself um, with within this combination of populism before the uh, pandemic the pandemic and the this, the, the shift with, within uh, uh, this year that we have already and what what will come after um, systematically? I'm not asking you who's going to win Germany, but uh, who or, or um, uh, in, in Czech Republic, uh, who's going to win the ex election? But what is it doing with our democracies? And yes, it's a question I, to all of you. Okay, just go ahead, uh, one of you, because I already spoke. Okay, I will be very short because it's it's more or less uh, also uh, should be answer the question about how how the uh, election will end in in Germany in Slovakia. We are pity we already had it. So, but you know how, what outcomes it was. So yeah, it it it. I will be a little bit cynical right now, but um, uh, first of all. What what COVID actually brought to to the system is that I think it, it accelerates various social and structural changes that that were coming in the future and they are already here. Uh, uh, for me, if if I could be really strict uh, with an example, is that it boosts the position of uh, of uh, local leaders. In Slovakia, they prove they can handle it. They can handle the crisis in comparison towards national figures. So, so th this is something really, really uh, that 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 is catchy, and it is it is a positive sign for the democracy. 
that from the, 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 the local level, they proved even in Slovakia, they are able to, to deal with the crisis. They are able to deal with the crisis situation. So th this is a quite nice example of how, what COVID brought to our societies. Uh, and what, what else? And I, I completely agree with Paula, what she said about, um, the, uh, it's, it's about in what kind of position you are in, in the parliament or in the government as a populist. Because I give you really a strict, uh, simple example, and, and uh, for sure, uh, Andre will be elaborate on it, that uh, in Central Europe, all our current governments are populistic, on, or, or even are right-wing populists. And you, you can see the perfect picture of what happens when a COVID pandemic hits those populists. In Hungary, they completely changed the structure of the state, completely. From the illiberal regime, it is in, in, in some of the researchers define current urban regime as authoritarian, not only illiberal. Poland, they change also the structure, not on the society, but laws that, that celebrate their agenda. Christian Catholic agenda. So they, they use and abuse the situation to gain more powerful also. Czech Republic and Slovakia, um, they are quite not safe in, in, in this transformation. But, but and this is something that 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 it is really positive in our lands that we have a strong civic society. And they secure it that they were not heading the Poland and Hungarian path, I think. That's, yes, Paula, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to add it um, to this varieties of reactions, even in the government. Um, um, I mean, you see, is Europe uh, right-wing populist taking advantage uh, of this uh, exception situation and taking it as a pretext to have new uh, authoritarian rules but that the, the, the same is not the the case for the us and for brazil they went to a completely different discourse denying that there is a pandemic and 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 doing business as usual so it doesn't seem to me to be a pother uh, which is uh, crossing all the right-wing populist parties around the world. Thank you, Paula. Andre, please. Well, regarding the support for populists, it, it's, it's rain, rainbow here in Prague, so it's probably a good sign, you know. Uh, it's, it's very nice. Anyway, uh, the support for populists, I would say that I, all the examples which uh, have been already, you know, mentioned uh, show that very much depends on the performance, you know. So, uh, you know, if you deny it, uh, COVID and then it basically, you know, destroyed your healthcare system, then it didn't work well, even for the support for your, you know, government or your, you know, next presidency, right? So I think it very much depends on performance in pandemic, you know, drawing on uh, uh, the country I'm sitting in, Czech Republic, we have kind of controlled environment because uh, this is one country, one government, one pandemic, and completely different reactions to the first and the second wave. So the first wave, it was very restrictive reaction. Uh, well, they did well, basically, in terms of deaths and this, this type of indicators. And, you know, in July, there was no change of preferences. So they... They still, they still, I mean, Babish, you know, the ruling party was still supported as much as it was in the beginning of the pandemic. And then the second wave came in, in, in the fall and the reaction was quite different. It was delayed, you know, it didn't bring, uh, very, well, it, it, it made us best in COVID. Uh, the, everybody's making, you know, it's kind of, it's, uh, it's, 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 not fun, it's not funny, but, you know, everybody's making jokes, jokes about it uh, when he declared it that we were best in COVID. We actually became best in COVID, but, you know, the other way around. And that was the second wave in the same country. And, uh, you know, this low performance then also transferred to the drop in the, in the trust in government. And now also, you know, the preferences are 
are going down, I mean, preferences of, of, of the ruling rubbish party. So uh, most probably, you know, depends on, on, on performance. And, and as Paul has said, uh, you know, the next factor will be, you know, this economic crisis, uh, which everybody expects. And uh, this might still, you know, change uh, the, the fortune of, of, of political parties in the future, for sure. And it will depend most probably also on their performance under under the conditions of economic crisis and uh, then you had this question about about democracy in general it's too early to say i think uh, uh, it's too early to say some people uh, you know some people predict that you know these emergency measures will somehow make us uh, used to uh, this you know uh, limitations of our, limitations of our freedoms that, they, that we are basically pre prepared or pre prepared to, to, to accept, uh, you know, some uh, changes along these lines in the future and we'll be fine with, you know, uh, limiting our freedoms uh, uh, if, you know, political leaders try to do it. Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, I mean, so far, all these, uh, all these uh, measures, at least, you know, in these countries, I know uh, they were temporary and uh, we will see. So I don't think that... Uh, uh, you know, at the present time, I don't, I, I don't, I don't expect any, you know, universal, universal uh, development and some kind of, you know, doom of democracy because of uh, COVID and emergency measures. Thank you, Andre. But um, I, I would tap on that, um, um, especially this uh, question of um, uh, economic crisis and the poverty and equal inequality that is going to bring. Um, there was uh, an article by an Italian professor. She was referring to uh, Italy, of course, but uh, basically uh, her uh, uh, vision was that uh, due to this uh, inequality questions, uh, the crisis of democracy is going to be even bigger uh, after the pandemic. Um, so I would I would really like to ask you um, um, uh, maybe to to um, um, to have a look at the in the respective countries uh, to say uh, uh, what what are uh, actually uh, um, uh, the perspectives uh, or um, uh, you know the immediate effects of uh, um, the economic crisis uh, on uh, the democratic systems uh, in uh, Germany in Slovakia and in the Czech Republic. And um, I just wanted to tell you that um, there are several questions concerning uh, still the topic of the populism as a um, um, uh, the theory of populism. Um, there, there is one question like that, um, that there are different approaches to the pandemic amongst populist parties as there is no populist ide ideology. That's one of the uh, persons that is uh, watching us uh, right now uh, is concluding. Um, there is criticism of pandemic measures in various ways. They appeal to be signifier of freedom in a right libertarian way. Is it something new for contemporary populists caused by the pandemic? So if you could maybe say a few words about the economic uh, implications on democracy. Um, uh, we know it from the historical perspective that it's, um, it's a big issue. And then uh, to refer maybe or maybe uh, go back a little bit uh, um, uh, on the topic of the uh, uh, populism. Um, uh, what is then actually something that is binding all this um, um, uh, developments? Viera, you were nodding, please. OK, uh, so I'm not an economic expert, but uh, this is the obvious thing that uh, uh, all uh, of us know that inequalities or decline of social status or limited uh, access to, to compensation, like during the COVID pandemic, opened the door for extremists, not even populists. So, so and in Slovakia right now, uh, it, is, it is that we have a government of, of uh, ordinary people. They, 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 they claim that they are ordinary, uh, who are running the government as a firm, but in comparison not to a national firm that is owned by Babish, but to a local a store uh, um, that, 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 is, uh, that is really owned by ordinary people. 
And those people were successful because they, they were able to frame the main topic that was concerned in that time, Slovak society. And it was that we need to fi fight against the mafia state, against those corrupted elites. And, and we thought, especially those who vote for them, that this is enough. And it, it isn't actually. And right now, those who were in power become more and more popular again because of, of their success and failure at, at the same time. So, so and, and it's not about um, the, the failure of economy. It's about the failure that we were stuck in, in, in the progress, that we are not able to move forward as a society. We, we don't have elites to, to move us forward. We don't have leaders and we don't have mainstream politicians who are willing to, to uh, promote those topics and those um, uh, procedures who help Slovakia to transform themselves in an open society that is living in 21st century. And this is that we, 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 we like, we are stuck in a um, transformation at, at, as we were during the Mechia regime, that we are freezed. So, so it's not, my, my, my problem right now is not about the economy because we, we are the, the car engine still in Europe. But my problem is that we freeze in the progress. And th this is why the populists are becoming, and even the extremists are becoming stronger in Slovakia. Paula, do you see similar tendencies in Germany? Um, yes, but I would like to add something to it. Um, um, I, I think the, the pandemic uh, bears a chance in the sense that it made us see a lot of problems, not only of democracy, but our, on our capitalistic society as well. So at the first lockdown, when everything has to really close, we saw things coming up like, uh, you have problems for uh, exporting potatoes. So potatoes producer could not bring the potatoes to the people who need potatoes because they are only producing for McDonald's. So there is a problem of a channel of distribution. There is a huge crisis on climate. Um, and there is, a, of course, what we saw as who got sick and died. First of all, the poor. Um, and the poor uh, in some contexts uh, coincides with minorities who are discriminated. So we have everything coming up together and showing us that the way we are living maybe need a reformulation. And, and here I, I really agree with Vieira. I don't see any organized party proposing a solution. Maybe because it is too late to disentangle the global economic way we are, we are doing politics. Maybe it is too late, I don't know. I, I, um, I mean, you need a, a, a lot of um, uh, utopian visions in order to develop a way out of this situation, which is a, a, there is no alternative. Um, and that's the problem of the left uh, in the last 30 years. So they embrace uh, the phrase, there is no alternative. And at the same time, when you embrace this phrase, you naturalize the situation you are living on and you don't see any possibility to change it. So what we need is maybe a strong civil society, a strong political force giving you some points. Just you don't need to have a completely reformulation, but you need some hope for a situation that we can go, go out. Um, and uh, in the first lockdown, there are some voices, at least in Germany, talking about that. Um, but they completely disappeared as soon as, as everything took a, ki a kind of normal shape and we accommodate to the pandemic situation. So um, I, I really hope that there will be more space for uh, visions for the future. 
Um, but if you are not able to generate it, so um, I see a huge problem and, and then there is a situation where you can have a, a response to it, authoritarian regimes, totalitarian regimes and right-wing populism. Um, here I have to bundle three questions um, and it's, um, it's about the role of the civil society. The one question is, um, do you really believe that the civil society is a counterbalance uh, as a protective measure against the right-wing populism? Because um, uh, Poland and Hungary uh, uh, prove uh, the opposite. Uh, so, and the other role of the education, uh, this was a question that came at the very beginning of, um, of our discussion. Do you think that the uh, well-educated society uh, is really generating um, uh, uh, more, is more immune um, uh, to populism? And then I have to bundle another one um, in it. Uh, that um, do you, because uh, there, there was one person that, that, uh, that wrote that, um, basically uh, those uh, movements are generated from the civil society so how do we uh, actually why why do we say that they are populist if it's uh, uh, um, um, coming uh, directly from uh, the civil society civil society is not uh, uh, only nice uh, and uh, and only left although this question of left left and right is uh, is a problematic one but uh, it's it's fair Denker is a civil society as well and the movements in Poland and Hungary and Czech Republic and Slovakia are actually coming from the civil society as well uh, Andrzej, do you, do you want uh, do you want to start with an answer well okay I can start but still I would like to say a couple of sentences to these previous ones at least you know some of them and I would uh, again follow, uh, it's a kind of follow up to what Paula said. I think that uh, it's exactly what, uh, what would be needed, right? And it could actually, uh, maybe something could happen, you know, along exactly these lines of like reformulating, you know, the relationship between uh, political power and, you know, global capitalism, if I may put it this way, uh, because this is exactly, you know, what we have been discussing for a long time. And this pandemic actually didn't change anything. It only just showed, you know, these problems. In, in, in a better light kind of, because, uh, you know, I think that this economic reaction, uh, and we started with that, uh, this economic reaction to, at least in some countries, uh, to pandemic was uh, different from, uh, or in, man, in many countries so far, it was, you know, different from, for example, the reaction of um, European Union and uh, uh, many countries of the European Union to financial crisis in 2008, you know, when, they basically resorted mostly to austerity measures and uh, budgetary cuts, and I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a consensus today, right? So, in in uh, at least rhetorically, uh, and it's all, it's important because you know language is not neutral, as we all know here, but it also creates you know this reality around us. Uh, at least rhetorically, uh, I have had a lot of you know investment talk, you know almost you know this Keynesian you know type of policies that we need to invest in order to get over it not like to cut, but to invest. And uh, this can be like the first step, which will be most probably uh, also manifested in, in, in um, uh, you know, increasing debts, public debts of, of uh, many countries, you know, reacting to pandemic and, and everybody's reacting to pandemic. And, uh, you know, this disbalance of, uh, you know, power of economy and uh, democratic politics has been actually conceptualized through, you know, this concept of debt, uh, Already in the past, we have, you know, this, you know, I think great book by Wolfgang Streck, uh, it's Gekauf the Zeit, uh, Buying Time, uh, where he's describing exactly, you know, like showing how this disbalance of power actually manifests itself in, in states being more and more indebted and unable to do anything about it. And this situation can now become more severe and actually, you know, open the way for, you know, kind of innovative thinking what to do about it and uh, maybe how to change you know how to change or to balance you know this uh, this uh, spheres of economy and this globalized economy and still like nationalized politics uh, more in the future well I, I don't know I as, as, as Paula said this is like you know Im imaginary thinking and it's it's a uh, it's, it's nothing nothing else but uh, I think that you know 
it's probably uh, at least like as for myself I, as, as for myself i can imagine it uh now you know more easily than before pandemic let's put it this way and uh, and uh civil society uh, well i think that uh, you know the person who asked the question is completely right uh, it's uh, not uh, like civil society by itself is not you know a kind of you know universal universal solution i think uh, depends on what kind of civil society depends on what you know uh what um, values it, uh, it 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 shares right and uh, exactly you know that kind of argument uh based on hungarian case uh, well it, Orban's success was based on uh, civil society. It uh, it was not anything like imposed, but it was quite embedded in the society. What happened in Hungary uh, before 2010 elections? Uh, there are great pieces on that by by, by Bela Greskovic, and uh, it clearly shows that uh, you know this is not the universal solution, and we need to go beyond this you know general general argument. I think, and uh, maybe education can help, but. Also, I don't think that it's uh, it's uh, just you know the only thing uh, which can help. Uh, of course, it's better to have some kind of you know educational program, some you know central affairsische Bildung as you as you have in Germany. We actually haven't been able to you know develop anything of this kind here in this country, and I would think that uh, it would be great to help people to get socialized to democratic values, but. Uh, on itself, I don't think it uh, it will change, you know, everything, right? Because you know, if uh, inequalities are growing, if uh, if uh, you know, parts of populations feel that they are left behind, you know, no education can you know manage that. It must be part of a, of a bigger pack, right? And that's all I have. <laughs> it's a lot, Andre. Thank you very much, Viera, Paula. Education and civil society. Is the key or not? Um, I mean, civil society is all the key. At least you have a repression, right? If you have a situation like Myanmar or uh, Belarus, uh, then uh, the key is not in the civil society anymore because you have a repression apparatus. But until this point, civil society is a key, a key player. Um, and of course, if the society is not always, homo it's never homogeneous and it's always also a space in which there is a battle among different views of society and of politics uh, competing to each other. And the question here is um, what happens in the state of anomia that Vieda already mentioned at the beginning, when civil society doesn't have the links to interact with each other, and then you don't have the possibility to formulate ideas or visions for the future. Um, I think that's a serious risk um, for a neoliberal situation we are living in. Um, and at the same time, when you have people organizing themselves and formulating um, maybe a protest against the situation, the risk to become populist and right-wing populist especially is very high. So you need a kind of contrabalance within civil society in order to provide it. Um, and uh, of course you need political actors um, able to uh, symbolize these views and put them in discourse so that people can uh, react to it. Um, concerning education, um, I, it depends what you are talking about when you're talking about education. Is education formal education? So things you have to know um, in order to belong to educated society. If that is the concept of education, I, I would say, no, it doesn't prevent you to become a Nazi. <laughs> so it can be very high, elaborate and intellectual and follow an anti-democratic uh, reactionary uh, way of life. It's possible. And then you can find very sophisticated ways to promote that. Um, if you're talking about education in terms of living together, learning how to live together, how to form the civil space in the sense of a democratic rules so that everybody can interact with each other. Yes, that will definitely uh, prevent to have um, a right-wing populist and a totalitarian movements come into power. 
Fiera. Uh, I will be really short because I look on, on, on the hours and we are emerging to, to the end. So I completely agree with um, Paula about the education that it, it's it's more about to, uh, the Athenian uh, uh, ideal of democracy, speaking together, improving ourselves. Yet yeah, this this kind of education we we need it more than, more than else. And what we actually need we need people with cross identities who are able to get in in the environment uh, in the societal environment and speak with those extremes those that are on the far so so i think this is this is missing and about the civil society yeah uh, it's uh right now i i will i will make more, more of you jealous because yeah we we had it in the past with the mature the regime and and it keeps us strong to together in Slovakia that we need to have civil society which is stronger because we had it we had an authoritarian regime in the 90s and, and it is rooted in our DNA and it is even more rooted after Jan Kuciak that we need to have it and and if I can compare it because we have similar forces like peace in Poland in our parliament even in our government in Slovakia they are trying to use and abuse those this COVID pandemic to to set their agenda but still they are failure because of the civic society because of their voices that, that needs to be banned so yeah and last but not least Civil society, civil society is also a bad one society. And Slovakia again proved it. Kotleba party, it was a civic movement which was transformed to, to a fascist political party. So yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Viera. Um, it's extremely hard to wrap it up um, what we were talking about because um, when I look um, at my notes, we 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 started with the uh, with the suspicion and uh, and uh, and the um, and, and the differences or uh, um, uh, distrust in within the society, but we end up uh, in the uh, civil society actually in the in terms that uh, Paula said it, uh, living together, uh, learning to live together um, uh, in a uh, in in a democratic space and learning um, uh, to to go by the, the democratic rule as actually um, a possibility of uh, of hope a shimmer of hope in all this um, uh, uh, all these changes that we are living through. Um, I'm still um, looking for some. Uh, um, for, for some hope in whatever uh, we um, uh, said today, uh, not to. Um, not to be so grim um, and um, this kind of um, strengthening of being together of understanding of cross identities that you spoke about Viera, of uh, people that are translators in the society um, Paula um, 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 spoke um, about the um, role of the media as well um, uh, or a debate debate how how do we open up the debate how, how we don't close the debate and we debate with um with um, um uh, actually everybody that is um, uh, on the ground uh, in this this uh, democratic theater um and um but still somehow i feel it is um um I, I i feel that we we have to have another conversation really about the vision for the future uh because i still don't see it 100 percent um in uh, whatever was said today we um uh, we basically analyzed um how different are uh, the uh, colors of populism in uh, central and eastern europe how um uh, what are the differences between the czech republic germany 
and uh, and Slovakia, but we didn't find a um, except for that and uh, except for living together the non-formal education, the form the, the education for democracy, um, and uh, the cross identities and um, and maybe um, um, uh, this critical approach to capitalism and and f finding out new solutions uh, for being uh, together in the global world, uh, that the, these are the topics that actually should be discussed uh, in um, hopefully next uh, round and uh, definitely during uh, during the whole conference. So um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't address um, uh, all the topics and I uh, am, uh, uh, there is a lot of questions um, in the uh, chat that uh, that will be hopefully addressed during the conference. For now, now uh, I, I would say uh, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, talk, uh, and uh, thank you, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us, and thank you very much for this open uh, open exchange. Uh, and I wish you now, um, everybody that is. Uh, that is um, listening to us and, and watching us online. Uh, I wish you uh, a very uh, a good evening, day or uh, midday, wherever you are, uh, and uh, discussing or thinking about whatever we were discussing here. And Martin is, uh, um, uh, uh, will be taking over, I will, say thank you very much Paula, thank you very much Viera, thank you very much Andre. it was a privilege uh, uh, being able to witness um, uh, your discussion and Martin uh, the floor is yours, thank you. Yes, thank you also to Katarzyna for your for impeccable uh, discussion uh, of this of this very interesting uh, debate. Uh, thank you for all the participants. And thank you all for your participation in audience today. And this is just a very uh, short technical uh, technical commentary. Yesterday we will start at half past nine uh, with the academic uh, part of the conference, and we will start with the keynote made by uh, Nona Meyer. So uh, those who are registered for the, for, the, for the part of the conference, please, we are starting at half past nine. And that was it for tonight. Uh, have a nice evening and uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.